recording, then as yeah. usual, so you can you can either choose to to, to to present your slides or make it more interactive so that the trainees can ask more questions. But mm -hmm. you are free to choose the way to take it. But Yabiba has already joined. Uh, I was uh, giving the introduction. So he's mm -hmm. going to be the main one leading this and I uh, will be like the backup. So, so welcome. Okay. Welcome, cool. Yabiba. Hi. I, I think and thank you so much for being willing to yeah, talk to our trainees. And I'm sure everyone is looking forward. So maybe we we can start, right? Like because it's already just the time, um, and I think yeah, we have also enough. I'm sure people will join more as we go. But um, and it's really a great pleasure to actually have Ting Wang uh, to talk to us. I think she has a lot more experience and also currently at Wayfair. I think she's the director in. Uh, Data science and analytics, right? That's uh, uh, or the data learn, the data science and machine learning uh, team. And I see that you have been also in booking for almost seven years there before you joined here. And before that, you were also um, algorithm developer at Deep Blue and a PhD. Uh, I think I see that you have done all of your studies in Netherlands. Um, and that's really, yeah. So I think she has lots of experience in number of companies, leading companies, as well as also just a lot of research experience, algorithm development. And I think a number of our trainees, as you might know, it's they are very young and they are just joining basically the career uh, in machine learning, data engineering and Web3. So a lot of them would, of course, like to see what is happening, especially like um, you know, when they join a global company that is at the forefront of um, this technology and demanding and wanting to grow and the competition high. So how do they, you know, what is the kind of the mental set, the mindset that's required, you know, what is for you talent and how do you see talent in your own you know, teams and in your, and when you guys also acquire a new talent, what are the important criteria? So if you could share those kind of elements, uh, that would be great. And I think trainees would be also be, uh, will not shy to ask questions. So I would say, let's use uh, the opportunity and ask thing, you know, a number of questions because I think it's probably very hard to find any other person that can tell you a lot about academic as well as industry um, for a number of experience, a number of years of experience. So. Without further ado, just let me give Ting the floor and yeah. Yeah. Uh, thank, thank you. you. Thank you, uh, Yabe Vais for the, for the intro. You, you I don't know whether I pronounce your name uh, correctly. I'm very bad. I'm, I'm very bad at pronouncing names. So folks, please bear with me. Um, I always say like I, I, I'm, I'm Chinese, like, but my name was not difficult. Like Ting is, is actually a quite easy one for, for Western people to, to pronounce it. Um, but yeah, please bear with me if I, if I didn't get your name uh, correctly. Um, so I, I uh, didn't have any slides. Uh, I really enjoyed the conversation last time with, uh, with a similar cohort, right, where I start by talking a little bit in general, like how would be e-commerce company a run science team and how do we build team what kind of uh, uh, talents that we are looking for and then we just straight dive into uh, questions and answers uh, I, I i think it worked really nice last time i enjoyed it a lot i think you know we uh, at the end has a lot of insights discussions but also fun so i would also encourage this group right just to throw out your, your questions and we can we can have a very interactive uh, session. Uh, so with that, maybe I, I, I'll just talk yeah. a little bit about my uh, experience so you know a little bit more about my, myself and you can you can also ask questions that are interested to you. Uh, so exactly as what uh, Yapubai mentioned, right? Uh, I had a background in uh, econometrics and finance for my for my study. So I did my bachelor and master in uh, University of Amsterdam 
where I got really interested into more the mathematical, like a quantitative side of uh, 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 science, right? So I, I did a research master um, there again, and then I, my PhD is around uh, a niche field in the financial market called micro uh, market microstructure. Uh, you don't need to know anything about that, but it's basically very similar to today's uh, data science uh, field, right? So you basically build uh, models, you use very high volume data. Um, it's, it's high frequency trading data in my in my in my uh, field at that time, and then you try to estimate uh, certain target variables, right? In my, in my again, in my research is the the price liquidity. Uh, uh, sorry, the the price premium for the liquidity. So I, I did that. Uh, I, I really enjoyed it. Um, then my first job is in the financial industry as a very uh, natural bridge. Uh, and there I got basically exposed to uh, a cross-disciplinary uh, team. Right? So there I was not just working with, you know, my research peer, which is like typical thing in the in the in the academic, like you, you only work with your peers, right? And you present in the in the conferences, uh, you have your peer discussion. But in my in my first job, I, I got to work with um, business leaders where you know they talk about the general company strategy i work with uh, engineers where they work on very um uh high performance like production system because think about like we are doing high frequency trading right you uh you you have very very small margin and you you throw in tons of tons of money right to to <laughs> benefit that that small margin um, so your, your system needs to be really, really robust. Um, so I, there I work very closely with engineers right, where I de develop uh, trading, trading algorithms, but, but I'm not the one that putting it in, in production. Um, so after that experience, I was like, I really, I really want to work in, in this kind of setup, maybe even more. Um, and by a sheer chance, I, I was brought to Booking.com. Uh, which is really, really a fantastic experience. So there I worked uh, in, in various business areas in Booking. I, I most almost really covered all the areas <laughs> uh, and I helped to build the science team uh, and scale it up there. So during my seven years uh, at Booking, our science team growed almost like fourfold or fivefold uh, there. Uh, so when I left, it's, it's, a, it's a team around 200 uh, people and it's powers uh, many key decision making and algorithms in various business areas. Um, so it was a really, really uh, great experience. And there I got to work not just with engineers, but also then with product managers, with designers, with uh, UX researchers, um, copywriters, uh, business owners, right? So really, really uh, cross-functional team. Uh, and I was able to build uh, teams in uh, you know, in the in the fraud detection area where we we do algorithms that detect uh, fake properties um, and also like fraudulent uh, payments behavior, etc. Uh, I also build teams in the in the uh, customer service center where we use algorithms to route in the tickets uh, and make more efficient prioritization on all the all the contacts. Um, when when I, uh, I I worked a lot in the experimentation, uh, I don't know. Uh, how many of you are aware? Um, Booking.com is very well known for its uh, A-B testing culture. Like everything, uh, basically every customer-facing feature that you 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 see on Booking Booking.com is A-B tested. Uh, and you know every every single day there is more than a thousand experiments, A-B experiments running concurrently. That's the scale uh, we are talking about at Booking, right? So we have a team around twenty people in total, uh, and we build experimentation platform, but also the methodology and uh, also the training and making sure you know the culture really stays right. Because experiments itself is just a tool. Uh, you can you can use the tool to your benefit. You can also abuse the two to to reach your goal, right? So it it, it can work either way. Um, so we, we have a team that focuses on this a lot, and I, I personally led that team for for quite some time. And uh, when I left, I also uh, well, sorry, not when before I left, I, I worked also in the new um, business uh, unit that was built in, at Booking, where we want to extend from just providing accommodation um, to also other part of the trip. 
for example, transportation, right? So flights and uh, taxi, train to attractions. Um, so all this, and that basically uh, requires our data journey to extend from anything about accommodation to everything else. Um, so I was I was basically staffing the team up to do the connected trip kind of data um, uh, data pipeline and also understanding how do we define those metrics and how can we then start to personalize the journey uh, go beyond just accommodation. So that that's roughly summarized my my seven year at Booking. It was a it was a fantastic fantastic time, uh, and then uh, Wayfair's job brought me from Netherlands to uh, to Germany. Uh, so I moved with my family uh, together to Berlin, uh, and I started uh, in in the uh, EU team, so the European team. And uh, after so now I've been there for like more than two and a half years. Uh, we establish our team as the dedicated uh, machine learning team for the whole operation organization. So just to give you some context, right? So, you know, typically, uh, uh, if you talk about machine learning, you would first think of, for example, marketing or personalization where machine learning are heavily leveraged. Um, what attracts me actually to this job is uh, Wayfair as a retail business, right, has a huge operation organization and also huge spend on the operation processes, right? Think, think about how typical uh, physical goods move from, you know, uh, supplier or maybe even more upper stream from the uh, manufacturers to the customer hands. The whole process is run by a team that is over 10,000. That, that, that's our operation team, right? So a lot of op uh, processes in the, in the past are built upon business rules or purely processes, but there's a lot of intelligence and automation that machine learning can bring to this field. So this is what my team is, is, uh, is doing. I can give you a few examples just to get, get a hand of it. Um, so one is forecasting, right? So if you think about manage a supply chain, everything starts with forecasting. You need to know how your demand look like for the farm future so that you can start to plan everything now, right? So you can know, okay, how I'm gonna order things from my supplier, how will those containers move from Asia to North America and Europe, how then my containers will move from the port to the, to the warehouses, how I'm gonna store things, how I'm gonna attribute or distribute things among all the fulfillment centers across North America, which we have a, a lot and then how I'm going to staff each uh, warehouses, how I'm going to staff all the tr uh, drivers, uh, you know, book trucks, book book uh, um, trailers to move stuff, right? So every planning comes from forecasting. And there we leverage not just machine learning, but also uh, econometrics, right? So statistical modeling to, to understand that. Uh, what we also do is also, for example, the delivery date estimation. Uh, I'm sure you know uh, we we all order things from e-commerce. One important decision make, making factor is when this thing will arrive. Right? So if if it, especially you, you know think about very bulky furnitures, it it, well, it, 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 it takes longer time, right? And it, sometimes you even need an installment at your home, which means you know people will come have to carry things to your bedroom, install it for you. Uh, so so. The, the actual dates on our website uh, in the past was uh, due based on business rules, and now we use machine learning to improve it. Um, and this is uh, this is uh, uh, what we have contributed. So it's it boosts the conversion rate on the storefront. It also helps the ops teams to know the promise that we give to the customer so that they can execute against it. Uh, I think a final example about what uh, what we do in this field is also um, uh, scam scam detection. So we have uh, uh, at Wayfair we have a quite lenient um, policy about how you deal with returns or with incidents. Um, so we have a lot of scam scam uh, um, uh, incidents, and and we are using machine learning to to detect those and also suggest prevention. Um, methods. Um, so this is this is a few a couple of uh, examples where where uh, you know machine learning teams is contributing in the 
supply chain or operation uh, space. I, I may uh, just want to uh, talk maybe one uh, one thing about how we build team and and also uh, recruit talent. Um, this is another big change I I, I drove when I joined uh, Wayfair. So. Uh, Two year, two and a half years ago, when I just joined, right? Uh, think of this is as a pure scientist uh, team. So it is a hundred percent scientists, right? Everyone is like a, a, a scientist, um, even their background and uh, their their competencies are, looks very similar in the sense, you know, they all come. Uh, typically, it, it is someone that come from academic. Uh, they they may take this as their their first commercial job or maybe the second one um, and they do everything right so they do from like you know data pipe pipeline etl to uh, put the prototype and to you know yeah, things running in production and also all the monitoring also all the analysis um, and i i basically uh, apply the multidisciplinary team that we had a lot of success at booking, uh, also at Wayfair. Right? So we started to build what we called a atomic team. And in uh, atomic team is also a multidisciplinary team. So it includes non-scientists, uh, machine learning engineers, uh, analysts, product managers. So every, every function that is needed to deliver and own a production system end to end. So this is a, a big transition we are experiencing at Wayfair, and none, not just my team, right? The, uh, if you look at the whole data science and uh, machine learning organization at Wayfair, uh, I would say look, we are almost like 80% to all staff in this kind of atomic team structure. Uh, and that's, that's a big transition that we are, we are making. And uh, it also hugely helps the teams to Gain a stronger uh, ownership and also more specialization in each of these functions. So I I, I think I talk a lot. So I, I'm gonna pause here. Uh, I hope you you have some idea about my experience uh, and also you know the some of the ML applications in the industry. Uh, I would like to open for for questions. So anything that you have in mind, uh, feel free to ask. Um, in chat or in, in yeah, in yeah. Person, whatever works for you. Great, yeah. No, I, I will just um, synchronize. Just the uh, Muhammad can go on and mute and ask. Yes. Uh, uh, yes. Uh, first of all, I want to thank thank uh, for joining us today and sharing our experience with the industry, and I'm very grateful for that. So I have a couple of questions, mm -hmm. um, but. Before that, tell us about your experience or wo your daily working job in the EU. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. So maybe I, I, I should clarify a little bit because I, I mentioned I joined uh, to lead the EU team, but now we have uh, a really a global setup in the sense all our projects, no matter what is done by the team or by the people that are based in EU, like in Berlin, or based in North America, uh, if they have global uh, scope. So it's not geo-specific. Uh, we have like all global projects. Uh, and now my team is, is a truly international team in the sense I have half, like around 30, uh, uh, 25 people in, in, the, in the EU and around 25 people in the North America, including Boston and uh, the headquarter, but also a few people in different TDCs. So in the Toronto TDC, in the in the Austin TDC, and and the West Coast. Uh, so that, that that's just it. So it's not just it's not a EU team anymore. It's a global team that are dedicated to bring the machine learning solution for the whole supply chain and operation organization. So how how is my day looks like, right? So um, my typical day uh, just consists of meetings. <laughs> Uh, I, I, I no longer do hands-on work because I have a quite big org, right? As I said, like around 50, 50 each people. Um, I put a lot of uh, effort into two things. One is building the team so that well, our team has very clear vision uh, where wh why we exist, what is our strategy, and what are the plans that we want to ex execute and deliver to the business. 
So there, I my meetings are usually with my my uh, atomic team lead. Uh, so so people that lead those atomic teams. Uh, so we have regular one on ones usually on a weekly uh, basis. Um, we also have like a staff meeting where I have a group meeting with with my uh, people and we talk about uh, usually uh, organizational stuff and also technical technical uh, uh, things. Uh, we also have like huddles. Uh, in my in my in my org, right, where people uh, present and share their work. So I join that every time because that's uh, that's a great way for me to to hear uh, the awesome work that my my team is is working on. Um, and then I have all kinds of like um, uh, spontaneous like one ones with everyone in the in the organization. I have my uh, uh, open open slot. People can just book one once. So this is a more internal, internally facing, right, towards my team. Uh, another big part of my time spent is more external facing. So uh, making sure that, you know, my my engineer uh, partner teams, their leadership are very much sync, synced with how we uh, want to deliver and also integrate our systems uh, with the business so that what they, we understand their priority very well. Um, and we are always aligned on what to what to work on next uh, so there and also with my my peer teams right so I, as i mentioned i'm the team um dedicated for operations there are also teams dedicated for marketing uh dedicated for merchandising so with my peers we also set up agenda and strategy for the ds and ml or at wayfair so yeah uh that's basically describes my my, my day Anything else that you you are, you are interested? Yes, uh, really a busy day. So I have a question. My friend, I have a four question. I will stick with one and uh, give the chances for my team, mm -hmm. my teammates. So uh, my first question is, would be, where do you find yourself uh, the most, in the academia or industry? Uh, you mean like where where do I find myself impactful or ha, ha, sorry I didn't I didn't hear that clearly. Yes. Uh, okay. Um, yes. Where do you find yourself most like uh, working? Ah. Okay. Got it. Got it. Yeah. Um, so I I have to say like I really really like uh, applying uh, my my skills and my knowledge. Uh, in, in industry, uh, far more better than than in academic. Um, this is very, I think, people specific. Um, but what I enjoy more in the industry uh, is, is several things, right? First, like it's very close to the the the, the real impact on people. Uh, so, for example, if you look at my 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 career path, right? No matter it is in Booking.com or at Wayfair the things we build uh, really affects every customer that we have. I right? so just take Wayfair's example, like if if we are accurate in, in determining the, the delivery date, uh, our customer will, will have a more accurate promise that they can trust um, that improve their decision making and improve also Wayfair's uh, business. Um, and there you see uh, very quickly, right? So so the work that you do, you can you can test it, uh, then you know how this impact the customer and also the business, uh, which I don't get much in academic world uh, where things are more theoretical and also things move uh, slower, right? So you, you you get to write paper, then you get your paper to be reviewed, you, you get to present in, in certain conferences, but, uh, you know, uh, if, you, if you have certain recommendations in your paper, uh, how that will be taken and how that will be actually landed is typically out of your hand. Um, so this is one thing I really enjoy industry. Uh, another one is the um, dynamic uh, landscape about it. Um, maybe this is also similar in, in the academic, if you are in the machine learning uh, space, because this domain really has a lot of like new development, a lot of new technology being introduced. But in the industry, right, you you get to you get to see a lot of uh, um, 
a lot of new 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 things like um, yeah uh, wayfair has uh, migrated to uh, cloud um uh, we have actually just complete the cloud migration i believe like last year i, th I think google has just published uh, um uh, papers on that um so you get to know uh, get to use all the cloud based uh, ml infrastructure and and toolings right so um, and algorithms wise, there's a lot of new development every, <laughs> every, every month, uh, is, is, is a very, very dynamic thing. And then for the business, right, it's, it's, uh, it's also, is a full of uh, challenges and problems to solve. So I, I only mentioned a few examples we are currently doing, but there's a, a, a tons more that I haven't mentioned. And those are all opportunities that, uh, I can, I can lead my teams to to slowly or or uh, tackle right uh, and that's something that really uh, attracts me and and motivates uh, what uh, motivates me thanks uh, adit hi Sing. thank you for uh, for your time for having hi, adit. Uh, my question is um how uh, data teams how are they organized in, in companies uh, you've had you you have a very good career path so you can talk more on that when it comes to other parts of technology other parts of tech say android you see you have android team you have a uh, backend team web mm -hmm. web development team so data teams how are they organized do they have like it's in for data scientists or, or they are, there's, when there's a team, there's a data scientist, there's a data engineer, and there's a data analyst, everybody in one team. I, I, want, I want to clear that up. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, so let, me, let me see whether I understand your, your question uh, correctly. If not, please, please do chime in and correct me. So, so I, is your question around how a typical uh, tech team uh, organized? Like I'm, I'm, I put a, a lot of emphasize on the uh, machine learning organization you, you you are interested in the the bigger bigger uh, tech organization is that correct yes yes tech organization but with the the ones that concern data and and machine learning okay yeah yeah so um it's it's usually very very similar right so if you if you look at any tech organization um or tech team of a big, big corporate, uh, like e-commerce is usually in this way, in the sense um, you have a typical team that is around five to 10 people. Think of like the two pizza team. I, I don't know whether this concept is, is, is familiar to people, right? Like uh, the team that you can eat, eat two pizzas. That's usually the ideal uh, size of the team. And within the team, uh, you have Basically, all kinds of engineers, right? So uh, at Wayfair, we we all call them software engineering uh, engineers. Um, but th there are several like branches, right? You have uh, store front, like front front end. You have back end. Uh, you have app app uh, uh, developers. Um, and sometimes when the when the team is very uh, customer facing feature development, they also have designers or, or user researchers in in it. And another important role is product manager. Right? So every single team has a product manager that uh, is attached to it. So well, the concept of this uh, atomic team actually applies everywhere, not just my team, but uh, it, it's, it was more uh, prominent in the tech team, but also simpler. So the, the function in the typical uh, tech team is just software developers and uh, uh, product managers. And what, what that team is, is entitled is they usually have a well-defined problem space, uh, so it, which contains like several big problems that they can, they can solve and they can solve more autonomously. Right? So they don't have to have a lot of dependency in other, in other teams and they drive their own roadmap and agenda. Uh, and then, you know, it lands up to uh, what at Wayfair we call it pause uh, or super pause, uh, basically three or four, uh, well, three to five atomic team that lines to a bigger domain 
and that domain lines up to a, a, a bigger one, and then you you eventually have this hierarchy towards the CTO. So that's that's how it typically looks like. Uh, and some other important function in the tech organization is, um, for example, infrastructure. Usually, you will have a, a, a independent infrastructure team, right? That deals with all the like for us, right? GCP is a big big part of it. it used to be about you know data center, data, um, all, all, all things around on-premise data center. Now we don't have it, so it's all about cloud, um, but also about networking, about security, about um, yeah, ML infrastructure. So all this is usually a uh, centralized uh, infrastructure team. Um, Do I miss anything else? Or uh, I, I, yeah, I think that's that's roughly roughly it. I, I so your we have your team that contain your team contains um, some software developer, web devs, and data engineers. Yeah. So so in at Wayfair, right? Data engineer is also part of the software uh, developer. Like, so software uh, develop uh, engineers competency as well. Uh, so in that you have different flavors, but they together is in the same same team. Thank you. Margaret? Hi, um, my question is about the system architecture for booking.com. Mm -hmm. uh, could you take us through a brief architecture of the booking.com um the frameworks tools used and just basically how the system worked and um yeah uh the second question is what was the most complicated moment uh that you experienced at booking.com mm -hmm. um were there was there any time where the system failed because of algorithms or anything and mm -hmm. how did you fix that mm -hmm. yeah so oh okay uh, last question sorry uh how did the emergence of uh other competitors like airbnb affect you mm -hmm. and how were their systems different from yours and what is it that you wish you would have taken from them cool those are fantastic uh, questions and um, maybe a disclaimer first. Uh, I, 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 I'm not sure I'm, I'm the best one to answer your, <laughs> your, your first question because that sounds really big and that sounds like a more a one for CTO rather than for, for me. Um, but I'll, I'll, I'll give my best try and, uh, and let me know whether this is something that, that, that you are you are referring to when you talk about systems uh, or it, you, you have something else in mind. So maybe first of all, uh, don't know many how many of you know, um, booking.com was written in Perl. I mean, if I could see your face, uh, I, I, want, I want to see how the facial e expression uh, looks like. Uh, I, maybe not even, maybe not many but, but is it, is it, I mean, is that, was that the case until 2017? Or is it the case still? Is it, so let me, let, me, let me go through this. So the, it, it's very similar to, um, to Wayfair, right? So most of the Wayfair's uh, system was written in PHP. And how, how this happened is you have to trace back into the when the company was founded. Right? So when, when Booking.com was founded, uh, Heert Young was the founder, uh, based, you know, he, he's a Dutch. He chose Perl at that time to write everything. And for, for a long time, right, the, the, the tech development team was actually quite, quite small. Um, because think about a business. I mean, many people think, you know, because what the customer get to is is usually the user interface, right? So the store uh, or, or the app, right? So the website or the web that you, so you, you think of that most, but actually when you think about a business as a whole, the one that you need to scale up the most is on the business team, like account managers in each different countries, right? Think about a booking that has a, uh, from the start is, is, is expanding in Europe, right? So in every single country, 
uh, almost city. It has account managers to sign contracts with all the hoteliers to make sure they can put their uh, inventories, like those those uh, hotel rooms, onto our website. And the website is just a shelf, right? It is it, for the customer to to book it. So for a long time, like you know, it 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 is a monolith that is built on Pro. And and uh, actually, booking uh, later became the biggest uh, community contributor to Pro. And it's it's because we hire very aggressively, right? So we actually bring uh, developers that write other languages to Booking and and teach them a uh, Pro. <laughs> but um, so I think it's it's like about uh, five five years ago, five or six years years ago, uh, we started to move to these um, microservices uh, and also to break down the monoliths and many of the components are being rewritten and written in, in different languages, Java, as, as, as you can imagine. And some components, for example, when it's come to very ML specific, it's, it's also using uh, like Python or, or Scala, those kind of languages, right? Um, but you, you could you could almost apply this to any comp uh, like tech companies that are long enough. Uh, it's, they all deal with the same thing. Monoliths, how to move that from microservices, uh, you know, old programming language, how to modernize that, and also on-premise. So everything, right, the same for booking, the same for Wayfair, used to be on-premise. We have huge team that manage our own data center, uh, how to buy, you know, those servers, physical ones, if you, you think of like booking, procure, uh, procured those servers, right? Put it in place. We have to manage the buildings. Uh, it's the same at Wayfair. So, so that's how the companies usually transit, right? To catch up with the modern tech stack, et cetera. Uh, and it, it's usually the same, the same process, right? So you, you start to realize you, you have to completely change your architecture in order to meet the modern um, tech stack and also the business needs. So you embark in this transition period where you, you break it down, you move piece and pieces, you uh, move on the, onto the cloud, et cetera. So this is also uh, something that is a common challenge for, for machine learning uh, because Machine learning is relatively new, right? And the, the the people that are working in this in this field, right? You you can you can build a model, you know, like in your in your notebook, um, you know, that works perfectly and and give very good performance. Um, but you will always face a very big hurdle when you want to not just productionize it. Productionize it may be easy still, like you can today, right? You can containerize it, you can you can deploy it like in in Google uh, in GCP, the, the uh, Google Cloud uh, platform, you, you can you can use leverage many of the toolings from, from cloud uh, uh, itself. But I'm also talking about once you deploy it, you, you have an API right that can be called and you can send back the your 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 your, your prediction. But to integrate that that thing into the bigger uh, software systems is also difficult because everything else uh, is kind of old, right? Think of like you know you you, you build a very powerful engine. Uh, and and now you 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 open the garage you you see a you know like a very old like a Beatles car right and you have to put that engine into the car uh, which is not not always compatible um, so many things actually need to change uh, in the surrounding systems to f to fit in like the, the models that we build and this is a typical challenge I see again and again right and this is also how I'm trying to lead my team um, to be more and more independent. So how do we define the contract and also define the domains so that what well, the science can be a more independent part and, and then the interfacing with the rest of the, the software systems can be easier. Um, but it, it, it's always a, a very, very big challenge. Um, I think you have some other questions. Let me recall. Yeah, you ask something about the comp competitors. Um, so, I, I I think what Booking.com is is really just like a market leader uh, in in the sense like you know it hasn't been challenged for a long time. 
so I we don't we don't take, for example, uh, uh, Trip Advisor or Expedia really as as a, as competitors. But I have I have to say Airbnb really disrupt the industry. Um, the 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 innovate not from tech stack. Uh, so usually it's not uh, really the technology that that completely you know disrupt in industry is really the business model so the, this whole idea about you know uh, not the big hotel chains that provide accommodation but everyone can rent out their home and it's this apartment can kind of view right that's really changed the industry and booking has been catching up very quickly so uh, if you i mean don't know how much you use booking um we have well, booking has a lot of non airbnb like uh, offers on on the on the website and i think what uh, booking was quite quite wise to choose to compete with airbnb not in the single property owner space by that i mean like you know um, like m me as i only have one apartment and i want to rent that out but they choose to to uh, come into these areas uh, from management sorry managed apartment i right? saw so still big company that you know maybe owns the whole building and they they, they rent all the all the um apartments to to instead of like you know normal uh, uh, tenants to uh, uh travelers right to to tourists um and there they they, they do they, they did really well and i think what well, that becomes a very significant share of how booking make business I, there I, was there was one on maybe the challenge that you faced. Um, oh yeah, like, yeah, the, the like biggest challenge I faced, and also yeah. did we fail? Oh, for sure. <laughs> um, of course, there. You know, when you when you uh, innovate, uh, you always fail. Uh, I I I never take this as a negative thing, and this is also always things that I I tell my team, and I try to build this trust. Um, culture in my team that you, you have to fail like you can't you can't if you don't feel you, you're not trying hard enough right so uh, and we learn from from our, our failures um at, at, at i think both at booking and at wayfair we have a very good culture uh the company in general right doesn't uh, view um you know issues like on the on the software side as as a big thing right so we we have like a kind of budget for how how much business loss that could come from from uh feeding of the system uh we we, we hold ourselves really high bar right it, is, it should be really really small uh, of that proportion but if it happens it happens right so you you reserve for that because you know you are innovating you are building new things you are pushing new features you are pushing new algorithms it, it will always uh, break uh, you know and and the the more important part is how you deal with that failure right so how quickly can you can you fix it and how uh, how do you do your post mortem and how the teams could learn and build things that can prevent this happening in the future so actually a, a good thing to know is those kind of firefighting um opportunities right so when, when bugs happen um it, it's, it's a great opportunity to learn I, I have people in my team. I'm also here from many senior senior uh, engineers, right? This this is their path to become senior. Like you, you 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 really get a <laughs> very urgent and hot uh, hot potato problem, right? And you try to solve it. Um, and and in this moment, like you 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 get to connect it with many different teams. You you quickly you know try to diagnose where the problem is, and th you could learn a lot by running that process so if you get a chance to to you know uh, join a company right uh, i would really encourage you to talk to the seniors and and learn a little bit how they how they do the do the fixing like how they how they deal with incidents and and read their post-mortem uh, documents it's, it's a great way to learn about mistakes that has been made and how they solve it uh, so usually you know uh, junior people don't 
too much attention, but I really, I, I think this is a great way for you to be exposed to say, you don't have to be the one right to, to be on the front line to solve it because it usually requires a lot of experience, but just by, you know, shadowing it and, and reading the post-mortem, you, you could learn a ton of it. And the net? Yeah, uh, yeah, it's so uh, it's so amazing to hear all of that. Uh, yeah, um, I have two questions actually. Uh, my first mm -hmm. question: uh, So, if you uh, uh, were to advise startup to like design system uh, like this, like Booking dot com, uh, what would your advice be? Like, if you, uh, uh, I mean, are you going to uh, advise against monolith uh, or like? Uh, I mean, since uh, most uh, companies like start with monolith, especially yeah. like uh, early companies, uh, but now we have uh, toolings and uh, other like uh, technology evolved a lot to make us like uh, design a very robust uh, mm -hmm. systems that could work. But we are uh, also like tempted to over architecture for even like uh, without a need. So uh, what mm -hmm. would your advice be like? Yeah. For this notes. Yeah. If you have a second question, I can uh, either come. Can I uh, say it now or? Yeah, yeah. Uh, okay. Uh, I, I, I can mean, be able I, to remember too. <laughs> okay. Yeah. The other question I have is, uh, uh, so like for uh, us, like uh, juniors, or like for someone like me uh, who wants to like uh, break into the ML engineering, uh, what is the chance of like? being uh getting hired on uh, one of like those companies like either in uh, uh booking.com or uh wefair uh, so do, how many like uh, for instance how many junior developers do you have on your team mm -hmm. yeah. yeah yeah so let me let me go by by your order um so first one uh, again right I, I i don't i'm not sure i'm best position to answer that because uh, I, I ha I'm dealing with a very niche uh, niche field, right? Like ML is not, is, is, it's not, you know, uh, it's not what you're going to start with a business, right? So you won't start with that. But the, actually my, my statement, this, this one hinge on a general principle. Uh, I think usually um, you, you already, you already preamble to that, right? Uh, is is very much inclined on design something that uh, it, that is more for scalability and robustness. This is this is a great. This is you know the quality bar should be high. We should aim for system that works this. But I think um, what is usually underestimated, and especially underestimated by more junior folks, is we need to solve a business problem that that's basically it like everything else is a tool to that right so you, you need to understand um what business problem we are trying to solve and if you understand that very well then it allows you to make your architecture decision or whatsoever design decision uh in in a much more um holistic way I, I i this is also my usual observations and why you know talk with my like folks in my in my team um is the same for scientists right they are very eager right to to learn about new technology about new algorithms and they are very eager to to you know really improve the model performance but very often they they don't really have the have enough i think curiosity about what what business problem I'm, I'm, am i trying to solve here and is it my solution really the the most roi effective way i think well you know no matter no matter how you started i think the company always go through the same the same uh, journey in the sense uh, at the beginning, right, as I shared, it, it's about growing, it's about scaling up, it's very much about the business model. So the business team needs support from, from tech, right, and technology should be a, the biggest in, enabler 
for the business. Um, but the, the, it, it cannot be you design something that is beyond what the business needs, right? So if you if you spend time, money, or effort in design architecture that your business doesn't sustain, uh, then then that's a, that's a failure. So I think that probably the the biggest advice I would give is uh, try try to be curious about the, the business behind it uh, and understand the business problem. So that while well, you can you can not just take into the technical uh, requirements into account, but also always link to okay, how how am I solve that that problem uh, in the end? And and when it comes to like you know uh, how, like what about uh, junior folks in those big uh, tech companies? Um, so I have to say uh, the general trend right is the the big companies right when they when they when they hire they usually focus on the core roles. Uh, and there's a reason for that, because the core roles are the roles that, uh, you know, when, when, the, when the folks come in at core levels, I mean, it, at Wayfair, it's certain level. It basically means you, you this person can uh, independently deliver a project end to end, right? So um, those, if you look at the distribution of, of the population, it's usually also the big uh, bulk of it. And the junior ones and the, the most senior ones, like principal engineers, are always always uh, on, on the on the two tail of it. Um, but big companies usually have all kinds of programs, right, to attract young talents because the, you, you are the one that eventually will grow more senior and becomes the 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 really the the, the core um, part of it. So those are usually the typical entry points to these uh, big companies, right? So like a traineeship or um, uh, in, uh, uh, internship or those kind of like programs that attracts uh, young talents. Um, and another way, right, is usually like smaller companies um, that are usually more more uh, open, right, to, to hire all kinds of talents. And you also get to work on uh, different problems, right? So if you, if you look at Wayfair, Wayfair's technology technology team so everyone that is under our CTO is over 3,000 people 3,000 right and if you look at the systems is it's it's so much right every team uh, start to only own uh, a small piece of it right so it becomes so so big uh, so it has to be specialized so if you join those team uh, as a junior folks you you get to see only that part of the system right it's very difficult for you to break uh, the, the the boundary and see okay i'm i'm in the let's see i'm in the supply chain the transportation and then the warehouse system technology team and if i want to know a little bit about storefront uh that that's that's almost impossible um but in a, in a smaller scale company uh, you you will get to expose to to a lot more, right? You you probably people next sit next to your to your desk is someone that works on on storefront, and then you can you can exchange knowledge and you can know how how that person build uh, their their features their systems. So th there is a trade off of it. I think we lost uh, uh, our moderator. Yeah, so, no, I I am back. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Um, okay, so there was one question for, on the text message. So your advice for those of us who want to pursue academy and research area of AI and ML. So any advice that you have on that? Um, uh, if you want to uh, pursue academia and res uh, research areas, um, it requires a little bit different skills. Um, but I think most importantly, it really requires passion. Uh, so you, you need to be really, really passionate about certain specific domain and you, you, you are willing to be always keep up to date about that. Um, and, and, and then, you know, you, <laughs> you basically build, build a part of that, right. And your, your, your direction is more theoretical. So you, you get to work on, uh, maybe a data set and your goal is to push the performance uh, of the, you know, certain models, you see it from 95% to 97%. That's already a big step change for academic. When it comes to industry, 
related to what I shared before, I would ask what is the business business impact of improving that model from 95% to 97%? How many you know incremental dollar value does that give us? Because the model improvement itself doesn't translate one to one into into the, the the business impact, right? So maybe certain decision making will not change if your model is, you know, two percent two percent more accurate. Then in in the industry, you wouldn't make the decision to invest in, in it. Not to say like you know spend any time on methodology or any uh, technology, right? So that that's the big difference. So you need to know what your passion is and and how. Are you are you interested in in pure the the uh, advancement in the in the algorithm or technology, or are you more interested in applying them? And and where then you get to not just about algorithm itself, but also everything that is needed to build a system. Right? So you need to work with data engineering. You need to work with analysts. You need to work with. Uh, uh, other software engineers, you need to yeah. So th there's there's a lot more other fields that is surrounding that which requires your your attention. I I, I still see many hands, uh, Riza, but uh, I don't know whether so we, I have, think we have we have yeah five <laughs> minutes, so we maybe speed up can, a bit. <laughs> yeah, we, we we can try to be just to accommodate. Yeah. Uh, three of them that's mm -hmm. there just yeah. if you are okay with that and then Gideon maybe just one question and then uh, Gannett and Emmanuel one one question each um, and yeah. then we can close it all right uh, hello thank you for taking the time so I, I'll keep my question brief uh, what would you advise like for someone uh, pursuing a machine learning career just starting out what tools or materials should we focus on if we are trying to become like a junior machine mm -hmm. learning engineer? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, um, so th th there, there, there are two uh, typical roles in the machine learning field, right? One is more on the scientist side; the other is more on the engineering side. The the sign for the for the scientist side. Uh, what it requires is a good mathematical understanding and de the algorithm development. So by that, you, you, you need to know the, the, the typical, you know, decision tree. You don't have to know actually neural network because that was very little applied in industry. Um, but, you know, the, the typical uh, tool set and all the, all the frameworks, right? Um, PyTorch, TensorFlow, these kind of things you, you need to you need to know. You, you need to be good at Python, right? So that that's a typical one. You need to know the notebook. Um, but but your, your 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 main your core is understanding those algorithms and and how to experiment with those depending on the on the use case. Um, if you go more for the engineering part, right? So which is more about how can I bring a certain algorithm into production? How I can run a very performant uh, production system? Uh, then it's, it's, I think right now the hottest one is the whole ML ops kind of concept, uh, which has an extra element on top of uh, dev ops, right? So it, 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 there, there, it, there is a model training, retaining, serving piece, and also the feature store, uh, et cetera. So typically, you, you you need to know one of the cloud offerings, right? So AWS or GCP, uh, and all the all the things in in those toolbox, right? So how to how to do the pipeline, uh, how to do the do the uh, feature engineering, how to you know set, how to build feature stores, how to serve uh, uh, serve a certain model uh, endpoint, etc. So so it, it's it's actually quite quite different, but uh, you, you need to know which one uh, you want to know, uh, you, you want to go because one is very uh, sci science focused, the other is more engineer uh, focused. Again, okay. okay, thank you very much. Uh, nice uh, to you and thank you for your uh, time.
and uh, I, I want to raise one question quickly. The uh, what kinds of advice do you give for a person who moved from that of academicians to that of the industry part? And what kinds of mindset is necessary to have? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so I, I think I already alluded to that uh, in my in my past talk. Uh, I think the biggest one is uh, really to understand that now you are solving a business problem. And solving a business problem is not just about the model performance uh, alone. It's, it's, there's a lot more factors that needs to be taken into account. Um, and you, you, you need to understand what is the ROI for your extra, extra return. I think a typical um, mistakes, a person that come from academic uh, going to industry is um, because in academic, right, you, you, you really want to push to the edge. So you spend a lot of efforts trying to improve things uh, a little bit, and, and that's already a big achievement. But in those in business, in, in many, many cases, uh, some those of those improvements um, doesn't make business sense. So you shouldn't spend effort onto that. Uh, so that, that would be that would be my, my, my biggest advice. Like, try to understand you are not in the business you need to make money right so how would your solution helps to make business impact Emmanuel? okay uh thank you for your time uh, as I, want ask, uh, uh, I wanted to ask you uh, myself in uh, an interview and uh the interviewer asked me, uh, mm -hmm. "Why, why would you apply here? Uh, I mean, as a junior, mm -hmm. what should be my selling point? Uh, why should? We, what if he asked me what? Why should we hire a junior engineer? Mm -hmm. uh, how, how uh, should I answer to that? Yeah, yeah. So I, I think what uh, what usually impressed me." in the in the interview is is two things right uh it's like this person uh knows a little bit about the company that he or she wants to work for so for example if you apply for wayfair uh you, you should at least know what wayfair's business is about uh ideally you know this is also what i do when i apply oh. wayfair right because wayfair doesn't have business in the Netherlands, which is where I lived when I applied for. But I still went through, you know, the website. I tried to use it. I went through the the uh, company's um, uh, earnings call where I can find their financials. Uh, I, I try to understand the business, right? I, and I try to think a few areas where I think hmm, this is interesting how they do it in this way. And and I either have questions or I have maybe my own ideas that I share. So that's why it shows you you are not just you know blanket applying whatever that is out there right you, you really uh, understand a bit about this company that attracts you uh, another thing that i usually impress me uh, is uh, about because it's for juniors right you don't have a lot of uh, commercial experience in the past so you need to show your learning uh, capabilities so any examples you can you can think of, right? That shows your learning curve, how you have done, you know, uh, give very concrete examples, how you have learned a new skills or, or new technologies, or you have tried some new things and how you, you know, tackle the challenges and achieve the goal in the end would be a great demonstration to the interviewers that, you know, you, you have the capacity. And this is what they are looking for from junior folks, right? They, they, they know you don't have, uh, industry experience so they, they're not going to ask you questions about that but they are looking for potentials and how do you show potentials is from uh, those examples where you demonstrate you you can learn fast you you, you can you can uh, overcome learning hurdles right and you can work with others to 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 improve yourself so those are the ones you should think of how, what examples you can you can provide Thank you. Thanks so much. Yeah, I sorry, like I, my background was very noisy, so I wanted to uh, tell that that's why I muted. But it's really a pleasure 
and I hope that you know um, a lot of people learned from your experience as well as also some of the very direct questions like the end you know where actually definitely they are facing this challenge of employers asking them and, mm -hmm. and having a tip like that especially how um, you know you would see it because that's mm -hmm. you are the ones or people like you are the ones who are hiring or probably interviewing so it's really great uh, and I think if we had time I'm sure there would be more even questions so very you know I would like just to say thank you and also just we exceeded four minutes but um, I think you know I hope that you, you don't have another immediate call so we're not taking from that but thank yeah, you so no, much thank and you thank you so much for for having me here I, I as I said I really enjoyed all your questions and I hope uh, I provide some some useful insights and also you know if you have any any other questions and uh, if there's future opportunities to to hold these kind of sessions uh, please feel free to reach out we will and really thank you so much and yeah, uh, yeah. so then we can close the, the call now the meeting now but yeah. again thank you on behalf of Ten Academy as well uh, and on behalf of the trainees yeah thank you, thank so you everyone hope you have a good okay. Friday and also a good weekend you too. Bye. Thank you. Cheers. Bye. Cheers.